we're going to be talking about the greatest adventure ever. And we're going to talk about Christmas and how you can make this the best Christmas ever. But today we're going to be talking about something um, that I've kind of been thinking about. In, in, and uh, when I was away on vacation, this story from the Bible um, came to my mind. And it's a story that I had, had talked about earlier in the year, around March or April. Um, but the story came to me and I was reading it while I was away and and uh, and then I started when I got back I started to kind of look into this story and, and uh, so this morning is going to be a little bit different but there's something that I really want to want to share with you today if we're going to put a title on today uh, we would talk call it the past the present and the future and sometimes when we read the Bible um, if you don't read the Bible, I would really encourage you uh, to just read even just a little bit every day, even if it's just five verses, even if it's just two verses. I would encourage you to read a little bit every day. Uh, but what we've done uh, is, is we've made a booklet that uh, Pastor Mariah actually made this. And what we're looking to do is it, it, it's an Advent journey through the book of Luke. And so... What we've done, we went. Pastor Mariah went through the 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 the, the problem. She actually put it, all the scripture and everything in here, so that that way we'd be all would be reading the same version of the scriptures uh, that you'd be able to read it as a family uh, together. Uh, but what it is is basically one chapter of the Bible per day, starting on December first, and at Christmas Eve, the twenty fourth, you'll have read the whole book of Luke and you'll have read about the whole life of Jesus. One chapter per day, and you'll have heard and read the whole story. So what I'm asking, what I'm really encouraging you is after service today, for everyone to come grab one. If, if each person in, the, in, the cup, in a couple, if you both want one, that's fine. But I would really encourage you as a family to gather for just a few minutes every day and, and to read the Bible together. If you're a single person, grab one. Make some time in, this, in the busyness of the day as you prepare ourselves for Advent season. And so I really encourage one, everyone after the service. But sometimes we read the Bible. It's it's. How many of you ever read the Bible and say and think to yourself, I can't believe I just read that. Like that is just strange, or how does that happen? And, I, and I've talked to people all this time. People send me messages like, okay, I just read this. You need to explain this to me because this is, this is crazy, or this is wacko, or this is whatever. Uh, so, and, and, and I understand that because the Bible was written, you know, in a culture, in a context, and sometimes it can be different than, than, than our culture. Often it's different than our culture. Often we read a story that Jesus did in the Bible as you read through the book of Luke or the book of Mark or the book of John, and you read a story and you're like, okay, this story is absolutely amazing what Jesus did. But one thing that I've been thinking about back when I was on vacation is during the life of Jesus, there was many people. He wasn't the first person who said he was the Messiah. There was many people that said that they were the Messiah. And do you know what? That still happens today. There's still people today that'll tell you that there's a different way to get to heaven. or that, And you see it all the time. People will lead cults. I was watching a, a documentary the other day and about, about, about uh, serial killers. <laughs> Please don't read anything into that. And, uh, and I just happened to watch it. I found it on Netflix and I watched it. And two out of the four people that they were talking about believe that they were the Messiah. So, there's some claim that there's many different ways to God. And here's one thing that I would encourage you with this morning, is that there's only one way to know what a counterfeit is. And that's to spend time with the original. Do you know that when banks, when you work at a bank, and they want to teach you how to recognize counterfeit money, they don't ever show you counterfeit money. They let you work with the original. And once you know the original, 
you'll know a counterfeit when you see it. Let that sink into your heart. And it's the same thing for us. If we want to know who really is a follower of Jesus, spend time with Jesus and he will help us. The same with Christians. You want to know if someone is legit? Spend time with Jesus. Know Jesus yourself. And then when they say things that don't quite add up right, you'll be like, that doesn't really make sense. Because I know what Jesus would say. In the Bible, there was a belief in Jewish tradition that there were four physical conditions that only the Messiah could heal. That only whoever was going to be the Messiah, that there was four that only that person could heal. And they would use that as a test of people that would say that they were the Messiah. You couldn't be proven to be the Messiah unless you did four things. And if you did one of those things, they would start to investigate you. They would follow you around. They would watch you. And then when you did the second miracle that said you were the Messiah, then they would start to investigate you and interrogate you. And if you did all four of those, they would declare that you were the Messiah. And that's how we're going to tell the difference between, that's how they would tell the difference between people that were fake and people that were real. Jesus. These miracles are known as the four messianic miracles, or the four miracles that the Messiah would perform. Okay, so this is going to be a little different than normally a sermon that I would preach, but there's a slide here that I want you to see. Each of these miracles, and it might be a little hard to read, but each of these miracles would fulfill an Old Testament sacrifice. The true Messiah... The true Savior of the world would be able to fulfill these because only God could do those miracles. So as Eileen said, Jesus was fully man and he was fully God when he walked the earth. So here were the four messianic miracles. Number one, he would cleanse someone from leprosy. Number two, he would cast out a dumb and a deaf spirit or, dumb, or uh, uh, out a deaf and a dumb spirit or a mute spirit that couldn't talk. Number three, he would heal someone who would ha that had birth defects. From the time they were born, they would heal somebody. And number four, they would raise somebody from the dead. But the key was they had to raise somebody from the dead that was lo dead longer than three days. We're going to talk about that a little later. And each of these miracles were symbolic of an aspect of our fallen nature. So, cleansing of leprosy was the curse upon man's flesh for their fallen nature. And the Messiah would do this and he would be the perfect sacrifice. He would do the sacrifice, he would cast out the deaf and the dumb spirit, and this was to symbolize the sins of individuals. He was the sin offering. It talks about it in Leviticus 4 and 5. And if the Messiah did these things, they would know that he was the Messiah. If he, helped, if he healed someone from birth defects, it was about man's, it was a symbol of man's inherited sin nature. We we're all born sinful. And this is a symbolic of Leviticus 1, the burnt offerings. If he raised someone to dead after three days, this was a symbol of man's lost fellowship with God. This was the peace offering that they talked about way back in the beginning of the Bible in Leviticus chapter 3. Leprosy. Leprosy was believed that it was, people believed that it was inflicted by God, meaning God gave people leprosy himself. They actually called leprosy, which was a terrible disease that people would hurt themselves and they, would, it, they couldn't feel pain. So it would just get infected and sores and, pus, and then parts of their body would fall away. They actually called it the finger of God. There was three times in the Old Testament that God actually gave somebody leprosy. Here they are. He gave it to Moses. He was, they called him the reluctant prophet. He was given leprosy in his hand. God took it away 
to demonstrate his power. So God turned his hand leprous and then healed him from it. Number two, Miriam was afflicted by leprosy by God as punishment for speaking against Moses, God's anointed. Then Moses prayed for her and God took it away. Number three, King Uzziah. He entered into the holy place, just imagine this. He entered into the holy place, into the tabernacle, into the church. Let's be thankful we don't live in these times today. And because he wasn't holy, he was inflicted with leprosy by God. And Uzziah actually died from this offense against God's temple. And because of these three things, people in the New Testament believed that God gave everybody leprosy that had leprosy, which wasn't the case. But they took these three things and they said, well, God must give everybody leprosy. And they called it the finger of God. And they believed that if the Messiah came, that because God gave it, that only the Messiah could heal it. So they had a misunderstanding of the scripture in the Old Testament, but what they believed is they believed that if God gave it, only God could heal it. And that's the first demonstration. Jesus cleansed the leper. It talks about in, in Mark 1, 40 to 44, Matthew 8, 2 to 4, and Luke 5, 12 to 14. After he cleansed the leper, he told him, go and tell the priests and offer sacrifice to Moses as Moses commanded. And he said this would be, on the next slide, it says this would be the guilt offering that we talked about in Levit Leviticus 7. Since no Israelite had ever been cleansed, this sparked an investigation of Jesus. As soon as he performed this first miracle, they started to investigate him. And the Sanhedrin started to investigate him. Then number two, the deaf and the dumb spirits. This is interesting, is that the Jewish people, they would actually demonstrate and they would actually perform exorcisms on people that would have, have uh, demons living inside of them. But the thing is, is they had a formula in which they did it by. And they always followed the same formula. And here it is. It was three steps. They spoke to the demon, asking the demon its name. Number two, the demon would reply to them using the voice of the person that they were possessing. And number three, then the person would cast the demon out by name. If, you, if, you've, if you've read a little bit of the New Testament, you'll know that Jesus himself used the Pharisees' formula in Mark chapter 5 and 9 to do this. This was a practice that he, he did. He said, what is your name? The demon said, legion. And he casted the, the pit into the pigs. He used the Pharisees' formula. But the Jews could not cast out a demon that was both deaf and couldn't speak. Because they couldn't follow the formula. So if they said to someone who was deaf, what is your name? They couldn't hear them to tell them. And because they couldn't speak, they couldn't say the name of the demon. So they decided that the real Messiah, if he's really God, he's going to be able to cast out a demon of someone who's deaf and can't speak. Because only God could do that. So he's going to break the formula, and he's going to do it. So they could not hear the command, they could not speak the name. So this led them to believe that the Messiah would come, he would demonstrate that he was God by casting out a deaf and a dumb spirit. That he and only he could break the form. Mark chapter 9, 14 to 29, you could read that at home. He was already under the investigation of the Sanhedrin. So the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they were already following him around because he had already done one of those miracles. So they're like, we got to follow this guy to find out if he is the Messiah. 
They hadn't started openly challenging him yet. But their thoughts in their mind showed that they didn't believe. It says this. This is a passage that I have read thousands of times and probably never, I never knew that this was what it was about. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, Jesus knew this in his spirit, what they were thinking in their hearts. He knew what they were thinking because they were following him and questioning him. He told them that this type required prayer. What we need to understand is numerous people mentioned this this morning, but what we need to understand is that Jesus, who was fully man and fully God, that he was a man of prayer. How much more do we have to pray if Jesus had to pray? We people say, I, I pray, you know, I, at the start of the month I pray, Lord bless this food for the whole month. You know, we do these weird, but the truth is, how much more, I don't know if anyone really does that, I just made that up, but, but like, how much more do we have to pray because he prayed? And you can follow his life. He spent time alone. He went off by himself. He brought his friends with him. He lived a life of prayer. He wanted them to know that it was by faith, not by a formula, that miracles happened. That it wasn't going to be speak, answer, cast them out. That he could do it because he was God. And this journey was going through. They were investigating him. It was symbolic of men becoming spiritually deaf and not being able to speak because Adam obeyed Satan rather than God. Here's the truth, and this is hard for us to, to, to put into our hearts, but you belong to who you obey. I didn't even want to write that down. You belong to who you obey. Says this in Matthew 12, 29. Can you enter a strong man's house or Satan's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house? So what he's saying is you can't just go into Satan's house and take back to possess people unless you tie up the strong man first. Satan. Jesus is telling us that we have power in prayer, that it's not in a formula. He forgave us of all of our sins, nailing them to the cross and having disarmed the powers and the authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross in Colossians 23, 13-15. So that's two. So the investigation is going. They're following Jesus. And then the third miracle, birth defects. Hebrew sages and religious people believe that birth defects were a punishment from God for the sins of a child or his ancestors. They base this on two scriptures. And here are the two scriptures. He does not leave the guilty unpunished, he punishes the child and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. We don't have time to get into that today, but you really need to look into the context of that and then in this scripture. Who gave man his mouth? Who, gives, who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? It is not I, the Lord, Exodus 4.11. So because of these two scriptures, they believed that anybody who was born with a defect of any kind it was a punishment for God. And that if the Messiah came, the real Messiah, that he would be able to undo that punishment. That was their belief. And in, in John chapter 9, this happens. There's a man with a birth defect, and they said, you know, it's because of the, the sins of people before him. Jesus encountered a man who was born blind. And the disciples right away, the disciples who walked with him 
all of the time. Said Rabbi, who sinned the man or his parents that he was born blind? Because these men had studied the Old Testament. They knew everything that was said. They could be quizzed on chapter and verse. They knew it all. And they still had in their minds, this is how it worked. Jesus told them that neither the man or his parents had sinned. It says this in John 9, 3. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And then Jesus does the strangest thing. People say, oh, the Holy Spirit or Jesus is a gentleman. Well, he reached down, he picked up some dirt, and then he spit in it. So far, not very gentlemanlike. <laughs> Makes it into mud. <coughs> and then he rubs it in the man's eyes. <laughs> Can you imagine? You come up and say, Troy, I have a bit of a headache. No problem. <laughs> Jesus placed mud, symbolic of sin and impurity, made from his spit on the man's eyes, told him to go to wash in the pool of Siloam. Many scholars believe that Jesus used dirt because we came from dust. Many scholars believe the man had no eyes from birth. And he used dirt because that's what he had used to create man before. That's what many scholars believe. And he rubbed it. Many scholars believe, and he created new eyes. But either way, he healed a man with a birth defect. In the performance of this miracle, Jesus demonstrated the removal of man's sinful nature. People will say all the time, oh, are my family just like this because it's a generational curse passed on? Jesus went to the cross to break all of that. When the man washed the mud off his eyes at the pool, at first he could see, but he couldn't see clearly. Jesus told him to wash a second time. This is a miracle that is showing us that he is the Messiah and that he is coming to heal spiritual blindness from all of us. This was a symbol of the burnt offering that took place in Leviticus 1. It was the sacrifice in Leviticus 1 that, that kept people clean before God. But Jesus was saying, I've come to fulfill all of that. The priests had to keep this burnt offering on this bronze altar all the time, morning and evening for the nation of Israel. But Jesus is the burnt offering. Sin entered the world by one man, it says, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men. Romans 5.12 Adam sinned, and that's why we live in a sinful, fallen world. But Jesus was saying, I'm here to pay that price. Number four, raising the dead after three days. This was very specific. These four things were very specific. And this one was even more specific. He had to raise someone from the dead that had been dead for three days. But he had to raise them on the fourth day. It couldn't be on the third day. Because in Jewish thought, this is what they believed that a dead person's spirit remained with the body for three days. So they believed that the spirit actually hovered over the body for three days. So that's why they believed that other people had been previously raised from the dead, because they weren't really dead, that the spirit was still there. But they decided that if someone could raise someone from the dead after three days, on the fourth day, that that would prove that he was the real Messiah. I have a, Penny has an uncle that uh, he, he's, a, he's a firefighter, uh, but he also 
uh, goes and picks up bodies and like in a hearse, not like in his arms, like in a hearse, and he'll bring them to the morgue or bring them to the hospital. Or bring them. And he said that he was driving down the, the road and they had found somebody who was dead and they went, the doctor pro pronounced him dead and they were transporting the body. And he said he was driving down at night, body in the back, and all of a sudden, from the back, but he wakes up. He wasn't dead. What? But this is what they believe. They believe that the spirit would hover for three days. So if it happened on the fourth day, decay and smell and decomposition would have begun. The body would stink. So if God could raise someone then, so could the Messiah. It was believed that when the Messiah would come, he would raise somebody from the dead who had been dead on the fourth day. After the spirit had left the body, after the delay, the decay had come, the flesh had begun to rot. And during this time, if anyone was suspected of being the Messiah, if they had done some of the other miracles and people were following them, it was reported to the Sanhedrin again, and the interrogation and the process of declaring this person of the Messiah would keep going. The people, the person who was going to be declared the Messiah could not be declared the Messiah unless he had approval from the Sanhedrin. It was this body of elders that decided all religious issues would be decided by them for the Jewish people. So first they would send the Pharisees and others to observe the individual. They would go into the interrogation stage. But what I want us to, to understand is in the last story, and this is where I want to spend a few minutes today. In the final story of Lazarus, Jesus gets called, but he waits. You can go home and read the story. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you where it's found in a little bit. But Jesus actually waits. And I always thought it was strange. His friend dies. He's close with the whole family. But Jesus stops. He heals people. He waits a couple days. Why does he wait till the fourth day? Because it's the last miracle. And he needs to show them I'm the Messiah. He's told his disciples, they're telling him, we need to go, we need to go. This sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. John 4, 11, 4. If he performed this final miracle, he would force the Sanhedrin to declare Jesus as the Messiah. Instead, they made plans to kill him. So instead of the Sanhedrin saying, yep, he, he, healed, he healed the man with leprosy, he healed the deaf and dumb spirit, he deal, deal, killed the person who, who, who had the birth defect from, from the rest of their life, and then, okay, he, and then he has this encounter with Lazarus, and then we're going to do all the studying, all the interrogation, and we're going to declare him the Messiah. No, they don't. The final miracle raising Lazarus from the dead Next slide. After the smell and the decay had begun, pointed to this peace offering that talks about in Leviticus chapter 3. And it was a symbol that the peace of God would be restored to all mankind through Jesus' sacrifice. Jesus, performing these four miracles, should have proven that he was the Messiah. John the Baptist sent word to Jesus asking, he said, were you the one? Are you the one? 
Or should there be, a, or will there be another? Jesus says this in Luke 7, 22. Go back and report to John. He sends word back. What you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy have been cured. And the deaf hear. And the dead are raised. Jesus is sending word back to John the Baptist. I am the Messiah. Jesus was telling John that his mission was accomplished. <coughs> that these messianic miracles, birth defects, leprosy, deaf and dumb, and the dead were raised to life. Not only is he the Messiah, but he has come to fulfill all the sacrifices that they needed in the Old Testament. Jesus is not who you think he is. Jesus is who he says he is. And so you can be as frustrated with your life and think that God has abandoned you or think that things are harder, hard or difficult, and they probably are. But you need to understand who he is today. Many people doubted him, even his friends, even people who saw his miracles, even people who walked with him. I want to leave you with something this morning, the story of Lazarus. It's a long story in the Bible. I'll tell you where it's found. We don't have time to read it all. Lazarus, Jesus' friend, died. Jesus is close to the family. They knew that Jesus was the only answer, but he didn't come. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever prayed and needed something and felt like he was taking way longer? Lazarus dies. He's dead for three plus days. Then Jesus shows up. The story is found in John chapter 11. And we don't have time to read the whole first, but let me read this to you. Starting in verse 17. On, this, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Just reminding us that he, he could have been there in time. <coughs> and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to him. This is, this is what I want us to take from all of this. <coughs> she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So, if you had been here, so she's talking in the past. If you had been here. And she says, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. So she talks about the future. She says, if you would have been here, you wouldn't be in this mess. And yeah, 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 I know. He'll raise again in the last day. But what I want is right now. Jesus said to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell on her feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. <clears throat> when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he replied. He asked. Come see, Lord. Jesus wept, it said. And Jesus said, see, then the Jews said, see how he loved them, loved him? But some of them could not could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying? So like, listen, you stopped to heal the blind man's eyes. If you wouldn't have done that, you would have been here. Verse 38 says this, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid upon the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But the Lord, but Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor. 
See, it had been past three days. And he had been there four days. And Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here. They may believe that you sent me. And Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Hands and feet wrapped in linen and a cloth around his faith, Jesus said, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Here's what I just want to leave you with encouragement this morning. Many of us in this room, we believe in a God who did. And we think in the past. We believe in a God that will come back and he will save the world. That he will call us to heaven. But some of us have lost faith in a God who does in the now. He is God of the past. He is God of the future. And you need to have your life right with him because we will all stand before him. But whatever you are going through today, he is the Messiah. And he still calls people out of the grave. They were so wrapped up in what he had done. They were so wrapped up in what he was going to do that they forgot what he could do in that moment. We believe in a God of the future. We know he's going to come again. We believe in a God of the past. You could have done it or you did do it. But in the midst of fulfilling these messianic miracles, Jesus is showing them and us, that he is not just the God of yesterday. He is not just the God of tomorrow. He is the God of today. He is the God of right now. In closing today, the investigation proved that he was the Messiah. And you would think that they would have declared him the Messiah, but right after the story in Lazarus, they begin to plot to kill him. We get so wrapped up in what other people think about us, about our walk with God, about our belief in Jesus, that we believe that the Spirit dwells within us. Maybe we just need to concentrate on the fact that he is the God of the present. And he loves you so much that whatever you're going through today, that it's not too late. No matter how many times you've turned your back on him, no matter how many struggles you have. You might be thinking this morning, Troy, you don't know me. You don't know what I'm like. You don't know the thoughts I think or the things that I do or the places that I go or the lack of faith that I have. No, you know what? I don't know. But I know this, that I serve a God who's the God of yesterday. He's the God of the future, but he's the God of now. And he still calls people out of the grave. And so I would encourage you this morning, we're going to take a few minutes to just worship together. And if you are here as an act of faith, and you're like, Troy, I need God now. Now. I don't need a future version of him or a past version of him. I'm tired of living on, a, on, a, on the high of, of 1987 when God did something amazing in my life. But I need God now. What I would encourage you is we're all going to stand together. 
And if you are here, you say, Troy, I absolutely need God to do something in my life today. I need a financial miracle. I need a physical miracle. I need something. We need to know that we serve the Messiah, that we serve God. We serve the one who does miracles yesterday, today, and forever. So I would encourage you as we stand together, if you're like, Troy, I need God right now. I would encourage you just to come to the front just as a symbol and just raise your hands towards him or kneel or anything that you feel comfortable with and just say, God, I need you in my life right now. I can't pay the price of all these sacrifices. I need you now. So we're going to worship together. Why don't you stand even if this is your first time or your thousandth time, <clears throat> we need God to work on our life today. So if you're comfortable, just your hands like this. Just say, God, speak to me today. So we're going to begin to worship. And as an act of faith, Don't pray for an experience that you had before. Don't worry about what's going to happen in the future. But God, I need you now. And it might feel like you're late. But I know that you're here. I know that you love me. So as we start to worship, why don't you make your way in faith? God, I need you now. Just cry out to Him.